breaking uh, assignment three? Crypto? You have the power now. You can break stuff. Are you becoming a dangerous in your own rights? Uh, I cool. only broke my own standards. What was that? I said I only broke my own standards. Well, you seem to be here, so that's fine. Unless we're all in your dream, I think you're, you're probably okay. Sanity is, I don't know. You can get more. All right, cool. Let's keep going. So I know Jan, I went over uh, his lecture on Thursday. I just posted that recording um, today. So if you weren't there, you can review it. We got a lot to jam through today, so we can get to the next really fun homework assignment. He said, reviewing it. Uh, okay. <coughs> so, what properties of crypto systems have we seen so far? So, what do what do these encryption algorithms? What do they allow us to do? Yeah. sense we're uh, keeping messages secret so that we can transmit them to some other people which gives us the nice properties of confidentiality we saw how we saw how we can get with public key crypto systems non repudiation right by signing something with your private key then everyone else can check it with your public key uh, but we didn't really talk about integrity so why is integrity important So why is it important to make sure that the message that was sent is the same message that is received? Yeah. Sure, but it's uh, confidential, right? So nobody else can read it. So what do I care if somebody else messes it? Yeah. So like trust the system, it's like you know that this message wasn't encrypted well for one person. Why would I use it? Mm, okay, so maybe, so say that again. Interesting. So more the human element, trust in the system, trust in the crypto system. What else? What else could you do without, let's say, integrity? So you just have confidentiality, right? So we have Alice and Bob exchanging messages, and you have Eve there who can see all the messages that get sent across. Yes, that's right. So uh, if you potentially had like a banking system where you had messages that got sent with mm -hmm. a, tr a transfer of funds, if it was in co or encrypted in a way that you could read it, but you knew the structure of it, where mm -hmm. say like the amount would be, you could then change those bytes to be a different amount than the original intended amount. Okay, so maybe let's say even if it's using very weak, terrible, as you know, because you can break it, a visionary cipher. But if you know roughly in the message, even if you don't know the key, you know if you can flip some bits in the message. Without actually reading the message, you can maybe change what the decryption result is and what the amount is. So you could have it transfer instead of uh, whatever, $500, $100,000 or something. Um, yeah, that could be one possible attack. What other possible attacks? Yeah. Just maybe it's like an unreadable message. Just like garbage. Yeah, maybe I flip a bit and now what the other person receives is garbage, right? So how do they know you actually didn't mean to send them garbage? Right? How is the recipient of the message supposed to know that it's a whatever garbage file, or maybe it's um, further encrypted, or I don't know, right? It, so there's you could um, mess with the availability of the message that way. What else? Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe they can use that as a way to manipulate bits to change randomly the decryption result. What about, so going back to the banking example, right? What if Eve sees this message with Bob, we can say it's Venmo or whatever, Bob's paying Alice $500, right? What if Eve takes that message, doesn't know the contents of it, maybe doesn't know what it's doing, but what if she sends that message again, and then sends that message again, and then sends that message again? How does Alice know that it wasn't four transfers of $500 and it was just one? Is there anything we've talked about that can help solve these problems? Some sort of encryption that might be able to say, it's like, it's like the metadata, say send with it, and then we can verify that. Yeah, so we need, we need something, we 
need either some additional metadata, and really what we're trying to get here is we need some way to verify the integrity of a message, right? We want to be able to say, what if an attacker flips a bit? What if a bit is corrupted? How can a bit just become corrupted? Packet loss, maybe the packet gets dropped along the network. What else? What was that? Sometimes wear and tear on oh, the yeah. So wearing tear on the server. Maybe the memory modules are bad on the server and it randomly flips a bit. Maybe a gamma prey comes in and flips a bit in memory, either before it's sent or when it's in transmission. And so we want some kind of mechanism to allow somebody who receives a message to verify the integrity of the message. And we want to do so in a way that actually um, can, we can actually uh, trust this process. So the idea here comes back to, and we'll be very specific here when we talk. So we're going to talk specifically about cryptographic hash functions. So I believe, have you talked about hashing yet? In what class? Oh, nice. Cool. Uh, cool. So. The, what's, so the idea behind hashing, and so, you know, it's kind of an interesting problem. So how can I have you trust that this message is exactly the message that I think it is, right? One, one simple, stupid way would be, well, I send you the message secretly, and then I transmit the same message, and you can verify that the message is identical. What's the problem with that? Yeah, you have to have some way to give them the original message so they can verify, right? Or if they already knew the message, then they can somehow verify. So the idea is we'll use functions that, let's say, map and arbitrary size data. We don't want any limits on the amount of data that we can verify the integrity of. That's going to output a fixed size bit string. Okay, so what does this mean? No matter like, the size of data, you're going to say, well, it's going to always output 25 bytes of whatever amounts of bytes, but they're going to be based on the original message to some extent, but that has like, that visual. Sure. So, yeah, exactly. So, okay, so arbitrary size data, what do we mean by a function? Yeah. Um, it takes an input and, like, deterministically produces output. Yes, so, like, the mathematical concept of a function, right? There's no side effects. You have input that goes in and output that goes out. And so if you give it the same input, it will always derive the same output. Okay. What properties would I want from this hash function? So let's say, let's say I use the hash function, you said what, 25 bytes? Let's say I have a hash function that takes the first 25 bytes of the file. And that's the hash function. Yeah. Should be one to one so that should be what? One to one so that like if you map one input it will map to another specific output so you know like what you're getting back. Okay, so it should be one to one mapped. So what would that mean? So every input maps to a unique output. Okay, so if I have twenty five bytes of output, how many inputs can I possibly have? Yeah, not bits, but I still need, what is it, 2 to the, what the 8, whatever 8 times uh, 25 is, 2 to that number. Um, is that satisfying my arbitrariness definition? <coughs> what if I fit more data? What if I want to be able to encrypt arbitrary data, and arbitrary data is larger than 2 to the 8 times 25? Yeah. Right, so I have several so properties, right? From this definition of what I'm looking for here, it has to be that different inputs will hash or map to the same value. Right? If you want to have an arbitrary size input and have a fixed size output, that is fundamental. That's going to happen. Right? So then what's the problem with taking the first 25 bytes of the input and saying that's my hash? Does that violate this property? No, I can give arbitrary size data into it, I could also make a hash function based on this definition that just outputs 25 zeros. Right? So every input maps to one value. 
But what am I, what are we trying to get from this hash function? Yeah, we want to be able to see if the input is changed, right? So if I have all of the input mapped to one value, does that help me detect if something has changed? No. No. What's the problem with using the first 25 bytes of the file? Yeah. What if the corruption occurred later on? In the yeah, what if the corruption in the first 25 bytes is the same, and then I just add on to the message, oh, but by the way, ignore what I first said. Uh, I really want you to transfer a million dollars to this other account. But it hashes the same, right? They hash the same value. We'll see specifically how we use this, but we want to understand some of the properties of these functions. Um, we also want the concept of a one-way function. You can also think of this as a trapdoor, although probably good analogy. I don't know. I'm not very familiar with trapdoors, but um, so we want a one-way function. What does this mean? Difficult to reverse, right? So I have an input, I can easily get an output, but if I have some output, it's difficult to go backwards and derive what's the input that generated that specific function. Okay, we already talked about using one-one mapping, we need deterministic, and we want, somebody else mentioned this property, right? We want a small change in an input bit should completely change the output. Why do we want this? Right, so the flipping a bit attack, if that changes one bit of the output, right, that probably leaks some information about what the input data is. Yeah. I was going to say, so it would be hard to spoof a match for it, but you were saying. Yeah. yeah, so this is part of it, right, to spoof a, or to find a different input that maps to the same output, right? If you could easily just, if one change in the input bit caused that, that could be, make that a lot easier. Okay, so some of the things, how are we actually going to use this in practice? Um, I think Jan, maybe you got the feeling of this while he was doing live Python demos, but uh, public key crypto is fairly expensive. Why is that? So for some of the RSA operations, yeah. Just because it takes a long time to generate a huge number that's built from two primes. So that's creating it. So there's creation of public and private keys that definitely takes a long time, uh, as you'll find out shortly. But even once you have that, to actually encrypt a message, what do you have to do? A bunch of math, a bunch of math specifically raising, you're doing exponentiation, right? So you think about a CPU, what operations are fast? Addition, subtraction. Addition, subtractions, binary operations, XORs, ands, nots. Right, multiplication is a little bit is slower, right? division is even slower, and then exponentiation is even larger, especially when you have these huge values that, um, that you have to exponentiate a very, very, very large prime, right? Because of that, we wanna minimize the amount of data we need to run through these public key crypto systems. So let's say that Alice wants to make a statement M that everyone knows this from Alice, right? So we've already talked about how we can do this, right? What's one way we could do this? She uses her private key to encrypt the message. She uses her private key to encrypt the message, and then everyone else can decrypt that message to verify that it's from her. What if this message is a, whatever, a video she just took of her trip around the world, and it's uh, four gigabytes? Do you want to do exponentiation across a message that's four gigabytes in size? No, it would be insane, right? It would be very, very, very large. So, how can hashing maybe help us out here? Because when Alice, so another way to think about this, when Alice encrypts the message M with her private key, does she have any confidentiality guarantees once she shares that message out? No, why no? Because her public key is public. Because her public key is public and anyone can decrypt that message. So why go through all the hassle of this expensive encryption operation? What is she actually trying to protect? Yeah. Uh, trying to protect the fact that she's the one that's sent to create the 
Yes, that, and that, that this message M is exactly what she says it was when she signed the message, right? When she uh, encrypted it with her private key, right? Yeah. Could she, she was going to use a hash function, could she then create the hash on her side? Uh, mm -hmm. So she knows what the authoritative hash should be, and then as long as the rails is the same function, they should be able to verify that. Cool. Like that. Okay, let's go with that. That's good. Yeah, so I think that's the question. Yeah. Right, so one thing uh, that we can do is Alice computes a hash of an M, right? We'll call it uh, uh, the signature of an M, right? So she develops a hash of the message, and then what does she do? So walk me through it. So then she would, she would make that public. Okay. Make that hash public so that anybody could verify with her. Um, so it makes the signature public along with the message. takes her signature of the message, and the message itself passes it to Bob. So what does Bob receive now? The signature and the message. The signature and the message, and then what does Bob do? Hash the message. Hash the message with the same hash function, and then verifies what? That the signatures. That the signature is equal. So now does Bob know that this message came from Alice? No, why not? This is actually her function. Anyone could have made that a read the video or the message. Yeah, so what could what could our attacker Eve do in this scenario to alter the message? Yeah. Put it through the hash function Say again? Put it through the hash function again? Yeah, so created some new message, right? So this <laughs> signature of M and, and the message itself gets passed from Alice to Bob. Eve gets it has her own message, we'll call message prime, and then what does she do? Makes a new hash. Makes a new hash, calculates her own signature of the message. Um, hash of m prime, so now we have a signature of m prime. And, wow, uh, and Eve then sends the signature of m prime and the message m prime to Bob, and then what does Bob do? And he takes the message M prime, hashes it, compares it with the signature, says this is great, this message hasn't been tampered with. So what's the problem? Yeah. So if the hash is a fixed size, could we encrypt that? Yeah, so if the hash is a, crypt, uh, is a fixed size, we can encrypt that with what? Alice's private key. Alice's private key? Do you agree? This is your scheme, so we're... Mm, not Alice's. Oh, to... No, we can do on. So it depends on our goal, right? So we'll go with the second goal right now. She wants to make a statement and that everyone knows is from Alice, right? So she wants everyone to be able to check. So what then what key would she want to uh, encrypt that signature with? Her private key, right? And so if, uh, let's say this hash function is, well, 25 bytes is terrible, but we'll say it's 512 bytes or something. That bits or bytes, actually. So now in this scheme, if we have Alice takes in her secret key, encrypts the hash of the message, and calls that the signature of the message, and then sends to Bob the signature of the message and the message M, now how does, what does Bob know? So Bob gets the signature of the message and M. And now what does he do to verify this? Yeah? He would uh, use uh, Alice's public key to decrypt it and then run the hash for equality. Yeah, it takes Alice's public key to de decrypt the signature of the message, which gets the hash of the message. And then she performs her own hash function on this message and verifies that they're correct. So if they're equal, then what, is she, uh, what does Bob know for certain at this point? 
that the, that the message was signed by Alice, or that the message came from Alice, and the message content is exactly what Alice says it should be, because the hash is not. Yeah. So how does this solve the Eve problem? Because Eve, I gather, has um, sure. Alice's problem key too. Yes. So Eve could still steal this, and I don't know, get the, the hash back, and I don't see how that changes anything. Perfect. OK, so now we assume that Eve is between these two people, Alice and Bob. Right? So Eve, again, just like before, right? Eve can create her own new message M prime. She can create a hash of M prime. But then what does she do? She can't re-encrypt it with Alice's key again. Right. So, can't have right. so the key problem here is that she can't encrypt it with Alice's secret key. Right? Because she can encrypt it with her own secret key. But then she has to trick Bob to thinking that her key is Alice's key. But if Bob uses Alice's key, this operation will fail on uh, the signature M prime. Does that answer your question? Yeah. check uh, CRC32, which is a type of hash function that maps the size of the packet to a fixed size value. That's just used to detect flipped bits because you can trivially find a new message that maps the same CRC values. So it maps arbitrary size inputs to a specific small, I think 32 is, must be 32 bits. So here you have a hash function that maps the 32 bits, but it doesn't have any of the nice cryptographic properties. So. Uh, but other hash functions do have good properties. That answer your question. Any other questions? Yeah. So is Alice sending the plain text M to Bob? Yes. Because Alice doesn't care. So in this scenario, Alice, Alice wants everyone to know this message and everyone to know that this message comes from her. So she doesn't care about keeping the message secret necessarily. So this actually has a lot of uses in actually everyday computing. So um, I don't think I'm using it right now, but sometimes I've used uh, email encryption to sign my messages. So here you want to send an email to somebody. You don't care if anyone can read the email, but you want them to verify that it actually came from you. Um, Files, so anybody use, is it ZFS that uses this a lot? Anybody use or heard of the ZFS file system? So it's the file system that does hashing of all of your blocks on the file system. So all the parts of your files are actually integrity checked. Uh, why is that important? <laughs> yeah, because actually, surprisingly, you can have hard drives have silent failures. Well, they will just corrupt or alter some part, some chunk of a file. And you'll have no way of knowing that. But this way, you can actually detect that. And if you have redundancy, you can recover from it. Uh, but then you have to run the checks of your whole file system every week or whatever to detect these things. Um, we'll see how this is used in password verification. So this, uh, again, as a little preview, the key idea is, a hash function is only one way. 
So if somebody were to steal our database of username and passwords, we don't want them to easily be able to extract everyone else's password. So this way, we, if we hash the passwords in a secure way, it's not as simple as just hashing. Uh, you can improve the security of stored passwords. This idea is also used in proof of work. So uh, like all of the blockchain and the consensus algorithms, most of them use some form of proof of work. And you actually do that by solving a specific, generating input data that matches a specific hash function, uh, or that, sorry, that the output of the hash function with your input has a leading number of zeros, and that gets exponentially more difficult to find <coughs> that input data. Also, I know you use uh, git, share a git commit with somebody, you have a long identifier. That's actually the SHA-256, uh, no, <coughs> the SHA-256 the SHA hash of Essentially, that you can think of that state of your source control system, that state of that repository. So that's what all those hashes are. The reason why they can use that is because they know that they will be unique, and it's difficult to find um, all of these properties. So the the properties that we need from our hash functions in order to have the cryptographic properties, right? So that we can use them to actually verify message integrities and in other ways. One of the basic things is what they call pre event resistance. The idea being, if I give you a hash value H, right, this is the difficulty of going back, it should be difficult to find a message such that when you hash it, it equals H. So if my hash size output is 256 bits, so it's a fixed size output of 256 bits, is it impossible to find a message M that hashes to that value? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, so theoretically, it should be, it's not impossible, how do you do it? Just brute force, and how many times will you have to try? <coughs> Two to the, it's a 256 bit output system or the hash size is 256 bits. Yeah, so two to the 256, which is very large. I don't know what it is, but that's a pretty large uh, space you have to search for, right? And maybe you'll find it sooner, who knows, but you'll have to at least try that many inputs. And then, even when you find one, are you guaranteed that this was the message that actually was used to create this hash function? No. Why not? Yeah. I was gonna say, aren't there You still don't want somebody to be able to get the hash and work out the password because then what's the point? Oh no, what I was saying is if someone's trying to attack to get access, if they could find an equivalent string that created the same hash. In that case, then it doesn't matter. You let them in anyways. So yeah, that's also another, um, in that sense, yeah, as long as they find another string that hashes that same value, it's fine. Other things that we want from our hash functions, we want that if I give you one message, and so a message M1, it should be difficult to find an M2 such that the hash of those is the same. Right? Again, we know because there's this fixed size output, there must exist some other message that hashes the same value. So if my output of my hash function is 256 bits, it better be the case that I have to try two to the 256 other messages to find the hash. Can somebody do what's two to the 256?
should be difficult to find two messages, M1 and M2, that hash to the same value. So what's the difference between a uh, second degree wind resistance and collision resistance? <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of interesting, right? So the, the collision resistance, so you have the, the attacker essentially has the choice between M1 and M2, whereas second degree <laughs> resistance, you're given M1. So you don't have any freedom of deciding what M1 is. So this actually um, makes the attacker's job uh, more difficult if they're trying to get to a specific end. Right, so some of the interesting ways that this has actually come up, so this uh, second degree image resistance would be in the case of the Eve scenario, where she steals the message and tries to create a new message M prime that hashes that same value, because she has that signature, so she's trying to create a message that maps there. An interesting thing about collision resistance would be if I'm going to create a, uh, this is actually a um, trick they've done before uh, when they break a hash function, is you output you find two messages that say, let's say, opposite things, like who's going to win the Super Bowl. I can't remember if it was the Patriots and somebody else. Was it the, uh, Anyways, so you can make two different messages that say the Patriots win or the Patriots lose. And if you can make those hash the same value, you can output the hash function, the output of the hash function to the world and say, here's my hash function. I'm going to tell you what this means afterwards. And then after the Super Bowl, depending on what the outcome is, you release that message, and they both have hash to the same value. Uh, so people have done this with breaking uh, things like MD5. You can do this with PDFs that hash to different PDFs that hash to the same value. Um, it's kind of crazy. So another kind of more, uh, an important thing and a part where uh, in hashing is, yeah, that hashing is uh, really used is oftentimes on a website. So let's see. So our scenario is uh, the web server wants every web browser, so every person's browser. So when you go to a website, uh, the website usually asks your browser to store some bit, some little chunk of information that allows the website to see who you are later. So this is the core idea behind cookies, if you've ever seen cookies. You go to a website, you say, hey, I'd like to access your website. They say, great, here it is. And by the way, store this little bit of information, this cookie. And the next time you talk to me, send that data back to me. So this way, the web server can link all of your requests that you make to the web server. And sometimes we want to do things like store the user ID as 50. Right? So this is, um, and what's the problem here? So what's the, the problem with this scenario? So if I, yeah. Well, I mean, if, it's, if you're storing on the user's computer, they could edit that. Yeah, so fundamentally, the web server is trusted, right? But your machine is not trusted. And this is actually, I don't remember the exact settings of Flask that I'm using, but I think on the submission site, this is a similar style. So if you look at the cookies for there, it should maybe says your user ID. I'm not sure. Um, Right, which seems insane because, well, you could probably alter your user ID because you have access to your computer, you can control all the data that's on there. So you go into your web browser, you change the cookie value to change your user ID to another user, like user one, which is me. Do we want that to happen? No. You can, and this is actually something that's really fun I think now you can just like right click and do an inspect element, and I think one of the tabs in the developer tools will show you the cookies that are stored with that particular site. 
And so this is actually interesting. So we want to have, and what if I just took this value and like cached this value? And said, okay, we store this user ID equals blah, 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 and the hash of that information. Yeah? If you're using serial user IDs, most likely you don't have so many users that brute forcing would be easy to figure out. Yeah, or I could just, you know, <laughs> the web server has to verify, yes, this is a valid uh, cookie from me, then <coughs> if all it's doing is hashing that message and comparing with the hash that you send, it could very easily create a new, you could create a new user ID, hash it, and send that hash back to me, right? Um, and for kind of interesting architecture reasons, um, usually we don't want uh, to have to worry about private keys. So we could use a signature, we could sign this value with the private key. Uh, the problem is that, well, I guess it's kind of the same. Uh, I mean, technically you could do that, but there's actually another interesting idea of using just an actual key, a random value. Uh, that we can get both authentication, so we can see that we actually were the machine that made this uh, value, and integrity of the hashing here. So basically, this key idea is how do we combine this key that we have with the actual message that we want to uh, store? <coughs> Excuse me. So one thing that we can maybe think of is called a message authentication uh, codes. <coughs> so one thing to think of is, well, we take the key, which is some random value, or let's say take the key, and the double bars here means append. So we append the message to the key. Sorry, the, yeah, append the message to the key, and then hash that, and use that to send back to the, uh, to the user. <coughs> So now, if we use something like this, why can't somebody just change the message and rerun the hash function? So yeah. they won't know the key. So they won't know the key, right? They, they don't know the key, the key stays on the server and never leaves the server. What does the, um, so it relies on the secrecy of the key. So what if my key was just Adam? Good key, bad key. You could, I mean, you could guess that. You could guess it, right? So yeah, the the actual the the whole security here depends on how again this comes back to searching. How random is the key, right? If it's just in a dictionary, how many words are there in a dictionary? How many people's names are there? Is it ten to the seventy seventh hmm. amount? No, it's in the, there's probably what, 20,000 words, something, 30,000 words, and then add names, and maybe add different cultures, and you're up to maybe 100,000 guesses. Right, computers are very fast, you can make 100,000 guesses, you can't make uh, 10 to the uh, 77 guesses very quickly. It's just a huge number, right? So, if we assume our key is is, um, excuse me. if we assume our key is randomly generated, and the interesting thing here is actually, and this seems like a scheme that should be secure, because we can calculate the MAC of our message based on a key, we can give somebody the message and the MAC, and then we can verify that when they give it back to us that we actually generated this, because we can rerun the hash function with this key, they cannot run the hash function. <coughs> It turns out that depending on the hash function, you can actually extend the message. So the way that some hash functions work is like MD5, it does, I, I don't know, it does a complicated, kind of very similar to what we saw with DES, where the input comes in, it kind of propagates, moves bits around, does all this kind of stuff. And what it outputs is the state of the hash function at that point in time. So it feeds all of this input to the hash function, it changes around its internal state, and its internal state is the output of the hash function. The interesting thing is this internal state you can load back into the hash function to recreate the hash function at exactly the point that it was at, at the end of this message. 
So then you can keep adding messages to the end here. Uh, you can actually extend the message and add more things to it. It's really crazy. I'm telling you this so you can look this up. This is a really interesting um, attack. And another way we can think about this is flipping it. We'll take the message then and append the key. And it turns out that, again, due to um, issues with different hash functions, you can actually easily find a message that hashes to the same value without knowing the key. So there's a, this is a uh, interesting way of doing this, a hash base map. So you can think of it as a function that takes in a key and a message. And it either extends or shortens the key based on the block size of the hashing algorithm, takes that, XORs it with a different padding. So you're kind of doing both. You're hashing the key with this pad, appending that to a hash of the key and another pad, and then appending the message to that and finally hashing the whole thing. Uh, so I just kind of want to show you one instance that's actually used in practice all the time, like every all, most websites, not most, I'd say, a decent amount of websites use some form of this to store cookies on your machine such that you can't modify it without knowing the key. And so I wanted to show a real-world implementation of using hash functions to achieve uh, interesting security goals. And now I want to turn our discussion to, we talked about uh, public key crypto systems, and what are some of the problems? So it seems like we started with symmetric encryption. We said, OK, this has clear weaknesses of exchanging Keys. How do you exchange secret keys when you're using um, symmetric cryptography? That seems like a very difficult problem. And so we said, well, hey, here's uh, this new uh, thing that people created of uh, public key cryptography, <coughs> where now you never have to share a secret between somebody, but you can still send messages to each other that are encrypted and confidential. You can get integrity by using hash functions, all of these nice things. So what are some of the problems in this public key crypto system that we've talked about? What are some of the assumptions? If we step back, what are some of the assumptions that we made when talking about public key crypto? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, secret keys will remain secret. Secret keys will remain secret? Yeah, that's definitely a problem if the secret keys get out. Can you, I mean, it's hard to fix that problem, I'll say that, but they, Actually, in real world implementations, they do have ways of dealing with that, with revocation lists. So you can revoke your key and say that this key, don't trust this key, I lost access to this key. Yeah, what else? Yeah. I was gonna say that from the beginning, we're kind of assuming that the, per the key that's the public key that everybody can see, we know for sure that it's that person. It's not like some other person. Yeah, so the other assumption we made is that everyone knows everyone's public key. Right? So in our message attack, we assumed that <coughs> Bob would use Alice's public key to try to decrypt the hash. Right? If Bob uses Eve's key but thinks that it's Alice, then we have a huge problem there. So uh, what else? What other problems? Yeah. Assuming that you can't, well, two things. One, assuming you can't brute force it, that's like having a big enough. And another is assuming that you can't go backwards from the public key. Yeah, so those are all the, and even things like um, cryptography that uses, like RSA, right, that uses factoring. So they're, one of the hopes of quantum computing is that it will be able to factor keys uh, and factor numbers in, uh, I don't know, in without brute force. And so uh, they're already working, and they already have crypto, public key crypto systems that are quantum resistant. So even assuming you have a quantum computer, you won't be able to uh, easily reverse that operation. Like I think elliptic, elliptic curve crypto is, I think, quantum resistant, but don't quote me on that. Okay, so you have those problems, what else? Yeah? There's a lot of calculations to do. Yeah, 
So there's a lot of additional operations that need to be done, right? So we talked about um, the efficiency of crypto systems, right? So how, you know, we already we basically used hash functions to get around the idea of having to encrypt an entire message if all you want is non-repudiation. But that still doesn't help us if we want to send a file that's four gigabytes using public key crypto. Um, we still need to think about that, right? So these are all kind of interesting problems that come up when we start actually looking at, okay, this is a cool idea in theory, right? We started with this idea of the box on the table, but then how do we actually use that day to day and in various systems? Um, so one of the things we'll look at first of how to trust public keys. And again, we talked about, so what if E replaces all the public keys with their own, right? So now everybody's public key is actually Eve's public <coughs> key. Now what can Eve do? Send messages on behalf of other people. Yeah, not just send, mes send messages on behalf of other people. She can also perform the man in the middle attack and essentially rewrite every message that's being sent. So for instance, Alice can, uh, so if Alice takes a message one, encrypts it with Eve's public key, which she thinks is Bob's, and gets some ciphertext. Now Eve can take that message because it's encrypted with her, this ciphertext is encrypted with her public key, but Alice doesn't know that. Decrypts it with her secret key, gets a message, and then uses Bob's real public key to encrypt that message, and a new message into ciphertext two and then sends it to Bob, and Bob decrypts it with his real private key and gets this different message. So we can see here that this, all of these mechanisms that we've been creating were predicated on, can we actually create, like, can people know exactly whose keys are whose? All right, so how do you do that? You're smart people, solve this problem. Yeah. Ooh, have one person who you trust to know everybody's key. Who's that person going to be? Jesus. Mozilla? That's interesting. I can trust them more than some other options. Okay, you could maybe centralize things, right? You could have one person that knows the identity of all of you in this class. Or, you know, in which in some sense we're doing already, not without public or private keys, but you know, you all have ASU right IDs, you all have ASU IDs, like I can map and link who you are based on that information. Uh, what else? Yeah? Two-factor authentication. Two-factor authentication, so in what sense? Uh, so like, if you use a specific person's public key mm -hmm. to encrypt something, you gotta like, put a fingerprint in or, or reply to an email or something like that. Right, so maybe some kind of out of band, like, uh, communication where I can verify maybe what your public key is. What else? Yeah, Spencer. We also store hashes of those public keys. That way you can just verify them. Sure, yeah, yeah. so we're, we're assuming that the public key can change the hash field and we change them as well. So that yeah, so we can look at public keys. We can say, okay, um, so we still have to have some way of securely transmitting them, right? But what else do we actually need? So, yeah. One way to do the check on the public key is to make sure it works against the opposite private key, right? Yes, but you don't have access to the private key. All you ever see is their public key, right? So think about uh, me, right? Let's say you wanted to, before you take, took this class, you wanted to send a secure message to me. Um, how would you find my public key? Yeah. Can you encrypt your public key and their public key? Because they have to use their secret keys then to get your public key. So it's kind of a bootstrapping problem, right? So how did, because still Eve can always um, substitute her public key for what you think is my public key. So yeah. what if, what if uh, in order to that it was valid. <coughs> then use the public key that you use to decrypt their message, to re-encrypt a new message. Then use your private key to encrypt the message again. Then send it back to the original owner. And the only way they would be able to decrypt it is if both keys match. So therefore, if they can decrypt the message you send back to them, 
you have the correct public key that matches their private key? Uh, I'd have to work through that math, but I think Eve could rip off your private, you signed it with your private key, she could rip that off with your public key, and then within there substitute her own message that she signed with her private key, and fakes you into believing that her private key is, or her public key is your public key. It's fundamentally, right? So, even you could go to my, so if you wanted to send me an encrypted message, you could go to my website, you could download my GPG key, right? But how do you actually know that's my key? Yeah. I was gonna say, can we have like, almost central hubs in the middle, where, I think this is kind of how SSL works, but basically everybody has these central hubs, say there's like a limited number, like, mm -hmm. say eight arbitrarily, but everybody then has to have the public key just for those eight, in person and then do what? And then do what? How do you know they're, but let's say you meet someone, they say they're Adam Dupay. Well, so and then they give you the public key. Assuming you already know. So like it's not someone new. Okay, so you can assume that you know them. What else? Create fake driver's license. I'm sure nobody in here has experience with that, but it can be done, right? You can, um, right? So the other interesting thing to think about is, so let's say you meet me and you say, okay, well, um, you've done your work to verify that I am who I say I am, right? So you can actually. So, anyways. Uh, So these are all different approaches that we can take. So we'll see in a second, but the, um, this idea of delegation, centralization, having some people that you trust, some central authority that's going to do this identity verification or to do this mapping, you need, fundamentally you need some kind of mapping of what does this key represent? Does it represent a person, a domain name, a company, 
Um, what does that actually mean? And then somebody needs to do that verification. So for instance, getting an SSL certificate, as we'll see in a second, uh, requires you to prove that you own this domain because you're getting a certificate that says this certificate is valid for this specific domain. By certificate, I mean public private key. So somebody else is certified that yes, you own this key. Um, another approach, so a lot of if you're um, very <coughs> trust, you don't want to put your trust in other organizations, you may want more of a decentralized approach, which is, you weren't supposed to get that. Um, and this is, brings up, uh, brings up a model called the web of trust, where essentially, you can use the signing that we talked about using hashing where I can sign your public key with my private key and then you can use that to prove to other people that I trust you. And so you can build this web of, well, I've verified your public key and you've verified their public key and I trust you, therefore I trust that you verified this person's public key. And then depending on how far that trust goes, you can then actually start trusting people. <laughs> so first looking at the public key infrastructure, so the way this works on the web is you have a certificate authority that's responsible for verifying the identity of people who ask for, um, so anyone can generate a public and private key for uh, the web, we're talking specifically here HTTPS, so when you get that nice uh, green lock icon. Anyone can generate a public or private key. I can generate a key, a certificate that says I am google.com. Right? But the problem is, again, the exact same problem. When you go to google.com and Google says, ah, here's my public key, how do you actually know that it's Google and it's not me pretending to be Google? And the way this happens is, again, with signatures. Google says, that actually happens in a couple ways, but Google says, hey, here's my private key and by the way, or sorry, here's my public key and by the way, this has been signed cryptographically by a certificate authority that you trust. So if you trust that certificate authority, you'll trust my public key is what I say it is. And I as an attacker shouldn't be able to convince this certificate authority to give me a key, to give me a certificate on behalf of Google.com. And it kind of ends up in this crazy hierarchy scenario where you have a couple trusted entities that they trust other entities, so you can have this hierarchy of keys being signed. And you can go up, and it's called the root of trust. Um, ultimately, though, the interesting thing is your browser is the one that decides essentially what you trust or not to trust, yeah. Um, so are public keys pretty static, or, like, or do they change every so often? So most of them will have a, um, an expiration date on them just in case of compromise you want it to be refreshed every so often um, so yeah that's the basic uh, idea there and again the problem of revocation list of what happens when somebody's private key is compromised um, you actually have a real big problem that google faces uh, because the the set of certificates to trust um, i think we talked about this a little bit who here used a, uses a corporate laptop? One well, that's not theirs. Yeah, so some people. So your corporate laptop, your company can install their own certificate authority on your operating system and say this certificate authority is trusted, which gives them the ability then to sign for any website you see, which gives them the ability to man in the middle all traffic that you're making out to the internet. Uh, Google doesn't want this because they know exactly what key they should be using. They know exactly what their public key is, um, so they use what's called certificate pinning. Uh, one way to do this is through a header that the very first time you visit a website, it tells your browser, this is the hash of my public key, never accept anything else. Like, it will not change. The problem is you can really break your website if you mess that up. Browsers are really good at respecting that. Um, so they need to manage a lot of different things, of issuing certificates, of managing my vocation, um, you also can get into weird political problems where a certificate authority in a company or in a certain country, like because you have you know, browsers are mostly made in the US and other countries have other certificate authorities and maybe we trust or don't trust the governments of those countries to subvert uh, and create certificates that they're not supposed to. So, 
And the interesting thing in here, as you've seen, are there are actually different types of certificates depending on how much the company has validated you and verified your identity. Um, the best uh, improvement I see in this area, if anyone run, runs a website, check out uh, Let's Encrypt. Uh, this is a organization that's jointly run by the uh, EFF where they will give you uh, free certificates for your domain. So oftentimes these companies want to be paid to do this work of verification. Um, and Let's Encrypt figured out a way to verify that you own a domain and they can generate a certificate for you. Um, you'll get different visual indicators of your status, right? So these are constantly changing. So you can see this for my website is just a Let's Encrypt certificate. It's just basic HTTPS. But if you go to apple.com, you see actually a green lock with these, this Apple Inc., which tells you a little bit about the identity of that company there. So the idea is this company proved to their certificate authority that they are actually apple.com and went through, or Apple Incorporated, that own the apple.com. Uh, you can see this in different browsers here. I think these are, I want to say Safari. Firefox maybe, Chrome somewhere in there. Yeah. So I don't really understand like, the context of like a website having like a public key. What does that mean? So you so this is what keeps your communication with the website confidential. Okay. So fundamentally they have the same problem. You go to a website, you say, I want to see a page. Um, you need to and it's a negotiation process. So you first talk over HTTP, you say, hey, I want to visit, a, I want to see something of your page, and I support HTTPS, and they say, okay, great, uh, let's figure out what protocols and everything we're using. By the way, here's my public key that you can use um, to, to talk to me, right? And so, but of course, that public key could have been intercepted in the middle, and somebody else could be substituting their public key for Google's. So you want to make sure that all this communication you're doing to Google is actually to real Google.com. Um, because if they man in the middle of your connection, they can impersonate you, they can alter the content that comes back from Google to make it appear like it came from Google, they can uh, steal your cookies and log in as you, they can perform actions on your behalf on the website, all kinds of bad stuff. Uh, so yeah, this is fundamentally, when you see this, uh, the lock icon, this HTTPS means that it's a confidential connection. So the thing that the other side, somebody observing will see that you're talking to apple.com, but won't know the content of what you asked apple.com. There are interesting things that I'll just briefly mention. Uh, like we talked about with encryption, the attacker actually does know the size of the message that you're sending, because that isn't encrypted. And so you can get interesting, there's been research that looks at, uh, even with Netflix, so you can, they can figure out just based on the size of the packets you're getting from Netflix, what movie you're watching, even if, even though it's 100% encrypted. So some of the websites, uh, there's interesting stuff there. And the other approach to this, will be, yeah, please. For sure. Yep. So even if there is a ah, 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 sorry. Let's. Uh, so, say it again. Okay, go. So even if there is a visual indicator, can there be a listening? I mean, theoretically, yes, it's possible if either the certificate's been stolen or there's a rogue certificate authority that generated that certificate uh, on their behalf. Uh, if you don't, if it's just regular HTTP, then anybody could have made in the middle, injected any content. Um, if the certificate's been messed with though, your browser will show a crazy red warning that says this is not the right certificate and you have to click like five times to actually go through. Uh, if you ever set the clock wrong on your computer, this can really mess you up because it, again, uses kind of the expiry date of the cert and you can get weird stuff happening. So the idea behind the web of trust is it's a completely different model. Instead of having these trusted entities that we want to um, identify users, we actually allow users to decide who to trust. We force users to 
verify each other's identities. Then we could, the cool thing in here is you can propagate trust. So I can say, yeah, I trust you about like 50%. And so the people that you trust, I trust less. And so you can get this really interesting graph of who trusts who. Um, so interesting areas of crypto research that kind of that we've talked about here. So we basically, uh, there are very interesting aspects of breaking crypto. So like crypto analysis and other stuff that we talked about. Um, there's crazy breaking the theory. So this is behind like MD5. They, uh, the first attacks on MD5 reduced it from, I don't know, I'm just making numbers up, but from like two to the 64 brute force to two to the 63. Um, and that is the stage where a, a hash function is considered broken and you need to move to a new hash function. Uh, implementations always have problems. I will highly recommend if you're interested in this area want to learn more about breaking real crypto systems. Uh, there's a website, CryptoPals.com. You can go visit this. Um, they have a series of different <coughs> challenges that take you through and you actually develop the crypto system itself and then develop the attack on that crypto system. So you can see how to, uh, like I mentioned, brute force keys when you have a padding or, or sorry, not brute force, but um, steel keys when you have a padding oracle attack. It's super cool stuff. Um, you can also come up with new types of crypto. There's all kinds of crazy uh, things like homomorphic encryption is a way, the idea is, uh, let's say you want Google to store all of your emails encrypted, but we also like it that we can search through all of our emails, right? Which is very difficult to do if the emails are encrypted because Google fundamentally should not be able to see the contents of those emails. Uh, homomorphic encryption is a way to actually allow another party to learn information about encrypted content and perform different operations like search or indexing. Um, secure multi-party computation is a super interesting area of if the two of us are, let's say we're health organizations and we have a bunch of health data about patients uh, for a certain type of illness, we're rivals so we don't want to share data and we may be prevented from sharing data, but we want to compute some function across all of our data like the average of the length of the illness or whatever. Uh, with secure multi-party computation we can actually do that on and get a result. The only thing that either of us learns is this result. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy, cool crypto stuff. Uh, any questions on this? Or we're going to go in the homework assignment. Yeah. Just real quick for the certificate pending, do those certificates also have expiration? Uh, the pinning has, has an expiration. So when you say the pin, you say trust us for an expiration. break each other, kind of. Uh, so this whole idea is you will learn how the web of trust actually works by creating your own web of trust. So you will learn about public key cryptography. You'll learn specifically about GPG, which is a specific public key crypto system, uh, verifying identities, and the web of trust. Uh, so, at a high level, the goals are you will create a public-private key pair. That's what we've been talking about. You can create your own keys. You will then register your public key with the submission server. There's an upload form where you submit to the submission server. And then, that way, everyone knows what keys are fair game. So, everyone's key will, you will have to create a key with your real name. That will be your name. You will upload it to the submission server where it will be signed by our class key. You'll get that back so that you can prove to everyone else in class that this is your real key. Uh, because you need to have your key signed by at least 20 of your fellow students in this class. There's 200 of you. This should be not a problem. Um, and the trick is you need to avoid signing any fake keys. So each of you, when you submit your key to be signed, we will generate you a fake key. This is called your adversarial key. Your goal is to trick people into signing your fake key for extra credit. 
Very important note, I need to make this 100% clear. I put it in bold over and over again. The whole notion of A, so as we talked about with public key crypto, keeping your secret key secret is important. Also, keeping your secret key is important. Uh, and specifically because we sign your key, the course validates that, uh, the course validates that you are actually a student in this course and that your key has the right name on it. This is how you can actually use that as a bootstrapping to verify identity, all that fun stuff. Um, so the name part needs to be exact and this means that do not lose your key pair. I, if you lose your key pair, you'll just, I mean, you'll be wherever you are at this assignment and you won't be able to progress any further. We can't have you regenerate keys and then we recreate those keys because your keys were already signed by other people in the class. It's just a nightmare. So, this is 100% on you to, there are a lot of guides out there for using GPG to create public and private keys. Create a public private key pair that has a name exactly what it is in the ASU system. If, so we actually already have this for all of you. So when you go to this page, oh, sorry, I already uploaded it. But it'll tell you exactly what your name is that you need to use in the name part of generating your key. So, uh, has an email. It doesn't matter what the email is, so you can choose whatever you want for the email. And GPG keys have a comment, so I have no comment. Um, so upload it to the submission site. I should have showed you to do this. And important point: do not lose your key pair. I mean, I back it up. Like, take whatever steps you need to secure and back up your stuff. Consider this the most precious thing you'll have for the next one and a half weeks. Just do not lose this key pair. I don't really care how you uh, accomplish that fact, but yes, okay. So then, okay, the key, another thing you'll need to do and figure out, translate this big, no. So this is the course's public key. <coughs> So every valid key in, so every key that's fair game in this class has been signed by the course's public key, both real keys and fake keys. You can basically ignore everything that wasn't signed by this key, and you can verify that it has this exact fingerprint. So this is actually the hash of the key, that you can see that it's actually this key. Now, the server will, as you can see here, so once you upload it, you can download your signed public key. So you need to download this, import it, in, so now that you have that signature that says, my key was signed by the course submission server. Then you can start signing each other's keys. And you also have your adversary public key and the adversary private key that you can get. It'll have the random name, but the same email as your key. And you'll have the public and private key that we're storing for you. Okay, so your goal, 45 points, uh, have your public key signed by at least 20 fellow students. There's a lot of you, I know, talk to each other, sign keys, get keys signed. Uh, there's many approaches to this, there's a lot of information online, this is something that part of this assignment is going out and learning how to use these tools. So this is a part of that assignment and walk through this step, create fake keys, sign your fake keys so you understand how the process works. Um, and the key part here, this needs to be 20 real keys. You don't necessarily know what are real keys, so this is up to you to decide how do I know that, I, that my signatures are by real keys. Finally, sign 20 of your fellow students' public keys. So again, this should be easy. Sign each other's keys. You sign, get your key signed at least 20 times. I would suggest more and sign at least 20 people's keys. The key is 10 points of this assignment are not signing in battle keys. So again, this is the trust, the web of trust model is actually verifying that people are who they say they are. Um, I'm gonna try to prevent myself from uh, uh, giving too many hints for this assignment because I've seen this multiple times and I've seen the cool stuff that people do. So, 
If you do not sign any valid keys, you'll receive 10 points. Right? I'll figure out the exact functions of roughly how much. It's usually pretty easy. Uh, if you trick people to sign your adversarial key, you will earn extra credit. Uh, the amount of extra credit will be determined exactly at the end, because I don't know, if one of you gets 200, if you all decide to turn somebody into a super person and have them <laughs> sign 200 keys, I'm not going to give them plus 200 points on this assignment. So <laughs> modulate it roughly something that is fair based on how many people are doing adversarial keys. Um, finally, and the submission is not actually went up yet, but submit your public key and your public adversarial key with all your signatures. We'll see how many signatures you have on there from there. Yeah. And it should be very pleasant.